and welcome to our podcast on free market structures. We're going to be talking about a theoretical, absolutely free market scenario where there are no government interactions with a market and to look at how that market will change and evolve and how the number of companies will change in terms of what they are producing and when they are producing identical products. So let's go ahead and jump in and see what we're talking about. So our first example, kind of an extreme in the market system, would be perfect competition. This would be the ideal in a market scenario, that every company is out for their own self-interest, that every company has their own profit motive in mind, and they are looking out for themselves. And in this scenario, there are going to be many competitors. There are going to be identical products, and all of those competitors are seeking the same buyers. So for example, Apples or staplers. There are many different companies that try to produce these very, very similar items. They might have a little tweak here and there in terms of a breed of apple or a feature on a stapler, but this is exactly what the free market is. If you think you can make a better stapler, you're welcome to join. In perfect competition, there are no barriers to entry into this market. You can pretty much just jump right in. You have an idea, you have a little bit of startup cash, you can jump right in and start competing and seeing if you can meet your own self-interest and profit motive. Additionally, there would not be any significant advantage for firms that are already doing this. Meaning that if you've been making staplers for 100 years, you've been making staplers for 100 years. But if a better stapler comes out the next year, people are probably going to buy the better stapler. They're potentially not going to have this huge item loyalty and say, well, I can't buy the newest stapler that basically does it by itself. I have to buy the original product that was around for 100 years. This is also good for buyers and sellers of this because there is great price information. Because so many goods have been sold and there is so much demand going on, we can really see how those things settle at that equilibrium price. So if I do want to start a stapler company, I'm not going to walk in and say, yes, my stapler will cost $100 because I had no idea what a stapler sold for in this market. There's going to be a lot of competitors out there selling theirs for an approximate price. So if I choose to get into that element, I should probably sell mine for about the same. A concrete example of this might be the airline industry. There are tons of different airlines. And granted, here in the United States, we probably see maybe eight or 10 different companies doing this. But if we look around the world, there are probably hundreds of airlines. They are selling roughly the identical product as somebody else. It is an airplane, it has seats, it carries luggage, it gets people from point A to point B. And so if people don't like American Airlines, they can look at Delta or United or anything else that's out there. Now, in this case, there are some barriers to starting an airline. This is not exactly the stapler example. It is pretty expensive to start up an airline company. We're going to need a lot of money to buy planes, to hire pilots, mechanics, etc. We're going to need access to airport terminals. And eventually, the market can only sustain so many airplanes in certain routes. So it's not a perfect example of perfect competition, but it's pretty darn close. We can also look at it from the price perspective. We had said in the previous slide that in this scenario, there are so many goods out there, there are so many buyers out there, that price becomes pretty solidified. The equilibrium point becomes pretty clear. A stapler costs about this much. An apple costs about this much. And very similarly with airline travel, an airline ticket between point A and point B will probably cost about this much. So if it costs you $200 to fly between Denver and Chicago on one airline, and then another airline charges $210, another charges $190, that's reasonable. There's probably not going to be an airline that says, we can do it better. We provide a solid gold airline with the most comfortable chairs in the world and five-star dining on board, so we're going to charge $1,000 for this simple flight between two hubs. In perfect competition, they're more than welcome to try that. But the way the market works as a competitor, they may not be that competitive and they end up being driven out of business. So the next structure that does exist in a market scenario is what we call a monopoly. And you can see the root in there, which is mono, which means one. And so a monopoly is when there is one competitor creating one product. New companies have complete barriers from entry into this part of the market because whichever company has the monopoly has the monopoly. 
it'd be almost impossible for a new company to enter into this sector of the market. There is a complete advantage for any firms that have been doing this before. And because only one company is out there, there is only one price. If you want this product that they are selling, you have to pay their price. You can't say, well, you're charging too much, so I'm gonna go to your competitor, because there is no competitor. And so one example might be an energy company, some sort of utilities company. And here in Denver, there's really only one competitive company that provides energy, and that is Excel. Now I understand that there are smaller solar companies starting up, there are smaller wind power companies coming up, there are some regional energy providers such as North Up and Fort Collins. But overall, if you're going to get gas and electric in the Denver area, you're going to be paying money to excel. There's very few other options in terms of getting that stuff that you probably need. There are some other competitors, but they really aren't competitive. Excel basically has a monopoly on the energy market here in Colorado. And because of that, they set the price. If they say it is 50 cents for one kilowatt hour of electricity, that's what it is. You can't negotiate with them. You can't reasonably say, well, I'm gonna go to your competitor, John Smith Electrics, and pay less. Because John Smith Electrics doesn't really even compete. Excel owns everything. They have a monopoly on this particular area of the market. A third market structure that can emerge is what we call an oligopoly. So we see some overlap with monopoly, except that the initial root is oleg, which if we can think back to our look at government, an oligarchy meant rule by the few, an oligopoly is selling by the few. So this scenario is the idea that there are a few sellers selling roughly similar products. So for example, the computer industry, or as we'll talk about in the next slide, the cable or direct TV industry. Most of these products that they're selling aren't fundamentally different. There are some differences based on who's making them, but they're pretty much the same. There is going to be some barrier for new companies to try and break into this sector of the market. This isn't as easy as the Apple market or the staple market. This might be the computer industry, where the companies that have been there the longest have a brand name recognition advantage. Well, if you're gonna buy a computer, are you gonna buy from the company you know, like Apple, IBM, Dell, Sony? Or are you gonna buy a computer from that startup company, John Smith Computers? Yeah, probably not. Even if John Smith Computers are amazing, you're probably not gonna buy from them because there is great brand recognition in the other companies that have been there for a while. Hence, they have an advantage. So even though John Smith Computers is free to try and make computers and free to try and jump into the market, they are, they are going to be at a disadvantage because those companies that have been around longer have more consistent and loyal customers. Another example might be the cable and direct TV kind of idea. There are truly few sellers of TV service. If you want cable, you have to go to Comcast. If you want some sort of other service, you might go to Dish, Direct TV, or something like that. We only have a few companies truly selling TV service. And fundamentally, there is not a lot of difference in their products. The channels you get on Direct are probably very similar that you get in Dish. They might be packaged slightly differently, so in case you want to pay this amount, you get these channels. But overall, it's the same stuff. You can get ESPN from any of these. For new companies, there would be a barrier to entry into this market. John Smith TVs is going to have a tough go at it in order to compete with the very well-established Comcast in this area, or the recently created DirecTV and Dish. Maybe John Smith TVs is amazing, but it's going to be difficult for them to jump in because people don't recognize that name. They're going to recognize the companies that have been around for a while. And so even though people are moving to things like Direct TV, Dish, or even other ways to get their TV service, cable does seem to have some sort of advantage because it's been around the longest. When we moved television service from just over the air with some rabbit ear antennas on top of your TV and moved it to cable, they were the next thing in line. Most people are going to recognize that cable will get them TV. And so new companies jumping into that market, such as DirecTV or Dish, are at a disadvantage. Consider John Smith TVs also. There's going to be a severe disadvantage for them because that competition is pretty darn fierce. There's only so many TVs out there and all of these companies are fighting for those people to buy their stuff. 
The last one we'd want to talk about is what we call monopolistic competition. And so in this case, we have many sellers, very much like perfect competition. We have many sellers. There is some barrier to get into the market, and there is some advantage for companies that have been around the longest because of that brand name recognition. But each of these companies is competing against each other, but each has a slightly different product. But within that product, each company has a monopoly on that. And so the best way to look at it is through a specific example of restaurants. There are bazillions of fast food or sit down or fast casual restaurants that are out there. Each is competing against each other for people to walk in and buy food. But within each company, they kind of have a monopoly on their menu and their cuisine. So for example, Arby's is kind of the only place where you can consistently get the sliced roast beef sandwich. That's what they do. Dairy Queen kind of has a monopoly on the soft serve ice cream with crazy mix-in things. Panda Express really has the monopoly on fast food Chinese stuff. Now granted, if they're two or three different restaurants sitting next to each other, the consumer certainly has a choice. They could say, oh, no, I want fried fish. I'm going to go to Long John Silver's. No, I want pizza. I could go to all kinds of different pizza places. And so each are in competition with each other. But each restaurant has its own identity in terms of what it sells, what its menu is, what its cuisine is. And so there's going to be some barrier to entry. Again, John Smith Restaurant might have the best food in the world. But can it compete right away with names like McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's? Everybody knows those names. It'd be very difficult for a brand new company to find its identity and then compete with companies that have already been there. Now, because this is, to an extent, almost perfect competition, because everybody's competing for a roughly the same market, the price is going to be very similar. Now, some are more expensive than others. If you want a hamburger, there's a difference between going to McDonald's, Burger King, In-N-Out, Wendy's, Sonic, etc. But for the most part, a hamburger at any one of those places costs about the same. You're not going to go to a fast food restaurant and expect to pay $10 for a simple hamburger. That just wouldn't fit in that sector of the market. And so, because each company kind of has a monopoly on their specific item, yet they are in direct competition with other little monopolies, this is what we call monopolistic competition. So that's about it in terms of our free market structures. If we can be thinking about those four and how they evolve in a free market scenario, I think that will give us a good chance to understand how the free market does work, how things evolve from that, and it leads us into the idea that sometimes the free market isn't exactly the best for all elements of society. So as always, if you have any questions, please bring those in. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you soon.